Hello, and welcome to The Damage. I'm Gillian Hamilton, your host. Today, we're going to explore safety as the new big, featuring Shaky, the small business safety struggler. Getting back to the new normal and fast. By the way, has anyone seen my pet elephant? Nothing like a ready, fire, aim approach after we've worked so hard to stay at home, be clean and wait to return back to work. The PM says workplaces must be COVID safe so they can reopen for 1 million Australian people who we now need to get back to work, he said. This is the curve we need to address. And after the federal government released figures suggesting that every week the current coronavirus restrictions remained in place was costing the economy $4 billion. Believe me, as a small business owner with very little government contracts, I financially would be very grateful that back to work order was given today. But I think someone forgot to talk about the Australian pet elephant. What's the name of the elephant? Meet Shaky, the small business safety struggler. I'm not sure if the people who are informing the Prime Minister have ever read the report, The Small Business Counts, developed by the Small Business Council. It's the Small Businesses in Australia economy, released by the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman. When you read this report with just a little bit more data, you find that there is a few assumptions being made of our Australian employers in regards to their capacity to meet the expectations of the national COVID-19 safe workplace principles. The Australian business makeup is very interesting. More than nine out of 10 Australian businesses are actually small businesses. They account for 33% of Australia's gross domestic product and employ over 40% of Australia's entire workforce. Small business is defined as businesses that have an Australian business number and an active GST role with turnover of less than $2 million per annum, which is their revenue, and employees less than 20 people. How does this relate to the national COVID-19 safe work principles? Let us ask some pretty important questions. How many sole traders do you know, besides some construction workers, who have a safety system? How many small businesses have a safety plan? How many have got an induction? How many small businesses have a risk assessment, or even more than one or any? How many small businesses think that safety is just for construction, mining and manufacturing. How many PCBUs identify as a PCBU? How many of you listening to this right now have ever worked for or work in a small business? How, how many of you have thought that a sole trader is actually a PCBU? Oh, you haven't heard of a PCBU? Oh, okay. Well, look, um, do the WHS laws apply to small businesses? These are questions that are indeed tricky and a little bit curly, a little bit like a balancing elephant on an office chair, because the answers are pretty interesting. Let's talk about exposure to workplace health and safety. Let's talk about Australian businesses' exposure to safety laws and safety inspectors. We would, find, we would find out about workplace health and safety law if an inspector visited our workplace and did a safety inspection and gave us some advice. This is true, but with 2.37 million employers with multiple workplaces and only 1,136 inspectors across the whole of Australia, then it will be very possible that you may never ever meet a safety inspector. Besides, if they visit 7% of all the workplaces, the large workplaces with 200 plus employees and businesses, um, all 4,271 uh, 4, of them, they can get to 60% of the workforce. Now, you can't take aim at these particular employees. Inspectors are not superheroes. If 
the 1,136 inspectors Australia-wide could visit 11 sites per day for their whole year, then they could complete an inspection of every single workplace in Australia collectively. This would mean an end-to-end -end visit of 30 minutes, including travel time and pleasantries between each workplace. You can see from the graphics that are provided here um, from the Australian Business um, Australian Bureau of Statistics, as well as the Workplace Health and Safety Safe Work Australia report, that the number of inspectors versus the number of employers versus the number of interactions is very, very minimal. The inspected working time for an inspector uh, should account for them to be able to do important things like meetings, uh, working through their working days, which would be having 252 working days a year. They also are allowed, of course, to have four weeks annual leave, which is 20 days. They may on average have 12 sick days. They may probably have at least 15 training days and would have meetings of a half a day per week at a minimum for their 40 weeks, which would take up 20 days. This allows 185 days left for them to do work such as inspecting work. Inspections are a very important and valuable method of engagement via the regulator to the employer and have been a significant value when the regulator adopts the safety advisor, principle, the safety advisor role. We worked through how an inspector could arrive at a site, do their visit, after they introduce themselves, have their small induction, do the inspection, then do an outro as in a, a summary of what they did, then have their regulated break and then travel to the next job. We believe that it would be only possible for an inspector to complete around three inspections per day. And that was if they were very close workplaces to each other with only a 15 minute travel time and then allowing a small amount of time at the end of the day for them to write up their reports. 11 inspections per day is required to see every workplace and we can see realistically only three that could be undertaken. If an inspector does, inspector does a larger visit at a bigger workplace, this visit could take at least two to four hours. We also ran through those numbers where they would travel to the job, they would do an induction and in some of these workplaces, inductions will take far longer than 15 minutes. They would then do their inspection of one to two to four hours. Then they would have a debriefing with the customer or the client. Um, and then they would have to leave to their next workplace and probably need to take their regulated break. If they were larger workplaces, we could only see a maximum of two workplaces inspections per day for a large workplace. Doing 11 work place inspections is almost impossible even to fit in my scheduling graphs. We know that workplace health and safety authorities last year in, in 2017-18 undertook 230,000 workplace interventions or turn up to workplaces and doing certain things with certain businesses, which is less than 10% of all business numbers. But how many of these interventions were multiple visits to single high risk workplaces. Some companies do tend to have a lot of visits from workplace health and safety uh, regulators. And so it is difficult to see how all businesses would ever see a workplace health and safety inspector. So your safety exposure. It is very rare that your small or medium business has had a visit or would ever have a visit to your workplace from a workplace health and safety inspector or regulator unless you are part of a workplace where there is lots of other workplaces around you, you're in a cluster of industrial estates or you've had an actual workplace accident and the inspector is due to come to your workplace to do a review or if you've annoyed one of your workers or the general public and they've called the workplace health and safety inspectors to make a report. The challenge of a small or a micro or a nano business, which is small being up to 20, micro being one to four and nano being a one person 
business with no employees like an ABN holder is that this is a huge worldwide regulatory issue. As the gig economy explodes, so many businesses and so little inspectors. Our government in Australia is not alone with this challenge, which will increase, not decrease in the future, with increased unemployment, pushing more and more people towards making their own way to earning in some way to help themselves through their lives. How else do we find out about workplace health and safety law? Do we study it at school? We could study it at university. We could choose workplace health and safety as a career. People may also work at large employers or large workplaces with lots of workplace health and safety requirements, all different kinds of workers and supervisors, and they see that the employer makes us do all these WHS things so the employer guesses that this must be the law. That would probably account for around 60% of all Australian workers. People who work in small or medium businesses, it may be difficult for them to find out about workplace health and safety if they've never worked in a large business. And people who work at small or micro businesses uh, with one to four or people who are sole traders, if they don't work in a workplace that requires high levels of workplace health and safety or at least workplace health and safety compliance with the law, it will be very difficult for us to see how they may ever cross paths with the requirement for workplace health and safety. The experience will vary from no exposure with real belief that it doesn't actually apply to their business at all or a limited exposure where they had an incident and then the inspector came and now they have to do safety or it's a higher exposure or they work with a big business and they have to do workplace health and safety. So they've kind of dragged them up and helped them understand the workplace health and safety laws because their person who pays their bills expects and demands that they comply with the law. So there is some current gaps between the law and how people think that the law actually even applies to them. I think that our current government actually does know that there are some significant gaps and they even state it. As a small business, it is understandable that you may have concerns about how to continue to meet your workplace health and safety duties at this time, referring to the COVID time. There are a number of practical steps you can take to manage the risks of exposure to COVID-19 at your workplace and meet your legal obligations. Here are some ideas to help you start thinking about what you can reasonably do to help keep people safe at your business. So this is on the Safe Work Australia website. There is a huge level of, there's a huge gap between the level of information provided and what is actually needed. Let us review some of the other aspects that are key to a business to be able to, to comply with workplace health and safety laws or even to have a safety management system. Safe Work Australia assumes that the information provided would be easily downloaded and would be used to solve the problem but they need to review these characteristics about Shanky, the small business safety struggler, and the very challenges they themselves have already identified. The most recent small business counts, small business in Australia economy report, shows that there is only 7% of businesses with a turnover of greater than $2 million. $2 million is about 22 persons, on average $78,000, of wages, so 22, uh, 22 people employed at $78,000, um, less tax, at less super. There is no overset heads included in this amount. Uh, there's no cars, there's no office hire, there's no marketing, those director fees or no insurances. Cash is indeed king and a report by Safe Work Australia in October 2014 in the Work Health and Safety Business Productivity and Sustainability Report stated that the relationship between firm size and the probability of structured work related training occurring, particularly in areas such as workplace health and safety, uh, SMEs or small to medium enterprises typically provide significantly less training than larger businesses, particularly in the area of workplace health and safety. Smaller businesses are less likely to adopt workplace health and safety promotion programs 
workplace health and safety activities. SMEs also lack the economic, human and technological resources required to make workplace health and safety investments and to manage workplace health and safety systems effectively. The financial fragility of many small businesses coupled with a longer time period over which the returns of these investments are generated make workplace health and safety investments unappealing to the smaller firms. SMEs have obvious constraints surrounding human resources. Small firms are rarely in a position to hire a staff member dedicated to a workplace health and safety, while programs coordinated by an external party may be either too costly or not available in the case of a rural or smaller business. WHS risks are commonly normalized or downplayed in a small business due to distorted, distorted perceptions about risk common to many employers. Moreover, the lack of knowledge and, ex and expertise around WHS laws and rules and approaches displayed by small businesses, employers can be attributable to both inattention by regulate, regulatory inspectors. Small businesses rarely seek out information on WHS programs and approaches. Dissemination of workplace health and safety information is further hampered by a reluctant, a reluctance among small businesses to, re, to interact with workplace health and safety authorities. Access to the new government directives slash information. So with all this information that I've just read directly from the Safe Work Australia report, we now have COVID-19 and we need to understand and actually say out loud, safety in small businesses is almost non-existent. And this is 93% of all business units in Australia and 40% of the Australian workforce. Now, access to the new government directives around COVID-19 and that information. Let us ask, unless these small businesses are on ABC News readers or the majority of readership that we expect at the moment is running through Facebook memes and people have switched off the drama and the struggle that they're having with the whole COVID-19 pandemic, their pending businesses struggle, they're trying to reopen, they're just Googling about how to apply for JobKeeper and Super and withdrawals and trying to pay those first wages that they need to pay. And then we bombard them with 1,300 brand new pieces of information. And if I'm a small business owner, I have to click 99 times to download every single piece of information that I need to print and then I need to read to be able to interpret and use that in my small business. Have the 2,371,000 small business owners who can't work now actually even read the government directives? Do they know what you're asking for? Have you notified all the ABN workers the same way that you do through taxes for other aspects about workplace health and safety COVID requirements? Do businesses who are not even big think that workplace health and safety laws even apply to them? How many of them can even afford legal advice or help from a safety professional at this time? If accountants are struggling in the middle of the night to keep filling out these job keeper and job seeker and all these other aspects for their clients, how the hell are safety professionals, how, how are businesses gonna get through safety? The financial capacity of these businesses that are less than the small businesses, in Australia between 2014 and 15 is only 7%. So businesses in Australia in 2014-15, only 7% have a turnover of $2 million or more. 26% have a turnover of 50K or less, and 34% have a turnover of 200K or less, so 200,000 or less. This doesn't include sole traders uh, data. In the small business counts, report, they mentioned that there were some barriers to businesses to implement innovation. So innovation being ways to be smarter, more efficient, to pivot their business, to be able to grow. 
they did a, a, a survey and they found that there was a few elements that were struggling to let small businesses move to that next step for innovation through access to funds, development costs, lack of skills and technological access, which is not dissimilar to the Safe Work Australia report in 2014, identifying these limitations of small businesses. We see these same elements as barriers to installing safety systems and processes. So we're looking at businesses that are naught to four people, 17% say that they don't have access to funds. When they're five to 19, they say that they don't, that 20% don't have access to funds. And we, we see that when there's 20 to 200 people, there's still 20% that don't have access to funds to do the work for innovation, let alone safety systems and processes. Uh, there is also uh, showing development costs of 12.4% up to 17%. Uh, We're also seeing that lack of skills is a highlighted uh, factor for the 0 to 4, as well as the 5 to 19, saying 22% came back and said that this is definitely an impediment for innovation, slash we also believe for barriers for installing safety systems and processes. We see that it is very difficult for small businesses to comply because of the fact, first of all, they're not sure it even complies to them in the first place. But we see that there's a limited capacity for businesses to perform and interpret the COVID-19 rules. We believe that 7% of these businesses that are greater than 2 million, the large businesses or larger revenue businesses, are more likely to already have safety systems and processes in their workplace. And that the Safe Work data is uh, working for and kind of angling towards these larger businesses. Not outside of the letter of the codes of practices, which finally are uh, essential to this kind of work, we know that these businesses have outsourced and insourced additional work and efforts to complete the required safety precautions at their workplace. And you can see financial commitments. They've got spit screens, they've got floor markers, they've got hand sanitizers, they've got additional cleaning, they've got security staff, they've got new ways of doing business, no contact apps, drop-offs, some full transformation of businesses have been undertaken. These spends, as you can see, there's a lot more work for safety systems and processes behind the scenes, which have been real serious and technical work by the safety professionals and the ones that can afford or have even asked for help outside. Businesses right now and safety teams of the seven percenters have never worked harder in their lives. So you can see that we think that there is a challenge for the 0 to 19, we believe that there's almost nil capacity for people to meet their safety systems and requirements. They've never met an inspector before unless they've had an incident. They have no resources allocated and they don't even think they're a PCBU. That's 4.7 million businesses. We believe that the medium businesses, 20 to 119, have some capacity for safety, but it, and it's possible, but it's not confirmed. The inspectors for those visits for businesses greater than 100 is much more likely because it'd be a work site where they could get to a lot of workers at one place. They may have a resource allocated and maybe a safety person, uh, but they're not also even sure of who a PCBU is. But then a large business has a capacity, they should know who a PCBU is, but I have had a lot of questions and comments and discussions with people about PCBUs and some of them, some of the businesses that are over 200 don't even think they're a workplace. Over 200 workers don't believe they're a workforce, workplace, and don't believe they have to do work. I've met a business that has over 700 employees and they didn't think they were a workplace and that they needed to have workplace health and safety. We have concerns for small, to medium employers. We think the government is assuming that the businesses have some safety systems already and that they at least know how to do a risk assessment. This indeed is a big assumption. It's a little bit shaky. Add the pressures of lots of lost jobs, 
lots of lost revenue, whole markets being wiped out and changed forever. And we're asking a business owner to visit up to 15 clicks and 99 we stopped counting for a hairdresser to download these pages and pages of data. Then we ask them to conduct a risk assessment and we give them a 39 page reference document, the model code of practice on how to manage workplace health and safety risks. We mapped this ugly, ugly process. And the green here on our video, and also for those in the podcast, you can go to the YouTube and also to Vimeo to view the, uh, the graphics here, but we mapped the process. There is some clusters of things. There's green, which means they're easy to print. You just print them off and put them on the wall. And then there's this ugly yellow box or orange box, which has got lots and lots, around 30 to 40 steps of things to do, uh, which is very tricky. Questions, interpretations, what is your business? What is your risk? And doing specific risk assessments, which again, I remind people, if I'm any business and I need to click around 30 times to get any information, I've already turned off. We need to help our small employers. Why? Because the ready, fire, aim approach will see us back at day zero. It makes the curve start to reveal something more concerning. You know, we, we really are looking at that if employers go back to work with little or no systems and processes and the cases start to increase again, we could see another outbreak. We need to help our small businesses be able to cope with the new safety requirements. For many businesses, this will be if you increase advertising, at least to let them know it even applies to them. I've... I'm not much of a TV watcher. I've been on the TV. It tells everybody to wash their hands, but it doesn't tell everybody that if you make a dollar, or even if you don't make many dollars at all, that you are a business and you do need to comply with the workplace health and safety requirements, the 10 steps for COVID. It's just not mentioned. And even some of the state governments in their roadmaps refer to some businesses as businesses and some other businesses not as business. So they themselves even give an indication that if you're a caravan park, you're not a business. I'm sorry, but a caravan park is a business too and they should be indicating that they are workplaces. Everywhere where somebody works is a workplace and must have COVID systems and processes in place to manage the, the return to work. So for many businesses, uh, this will be the first time that they've ever done any safety. Because remember, 93% of all business units, 40% of all of our employee, people who work at work, 40% of all employees work for a small business. So what are some solutions that we can propose that maybe could help a small business getting back to COVID? So we're suggesting that they should consider the release of a safety grant program where a professional who may be vetted by the government could help the business install the systems and processes. Uh, the professional may even work directly for the uh, state regulator. They might do a drive and, and engage a number of people who'd be able to go around and assist as a helpful safety Sam to be able to help people get back to work safely, not just going to do an inspection afterwards and saying that we have a problem here, suggesting and helping them get back to work. You might even consider a tax credit for some people buying safety services to help them um, comply, cap it, specify it, manage the approved professionals, do it commercially and make sure that our country has the right systems and processes so that we don't push the spread. Offer grants by government for businesses that qualify with financial hardship, specifically for safety systems and processes. Make example videos of different workplaces in exactly how they did it and use big businesses as an example as safety leaders, but consider the prices of installation of these services and how much does it cost to comply. Help uh, small businesses understand how big businesses have done it so that they don't have to jump through all the hurdles that these big businesses of our seven percenters have already done in the last few months because it has taken them months and even the large businesses are not yet fully compliant. 
We should make certain also that products are available to be buying for work from government agencies, such as liquid soap, hand wash, gloves, paper towels, water bottles for single use, plastic cups, plastic cutlery. With the current shortages, if you go down to the local supermarket and buy hand sanitizer, a pack of 10 um, for your workstations, well, first of all, you'd be lucky to find 10. And second of all, when you get to the supermarket, you'll be berated for picking up more than one. And then you'll have to go to five or six other shops, be called a hoarder, and then you can't actually even comply with the requirements that you need to keep the workplace safe. We could also suggest that you should increase the advertising of all these requirements to meet workplace health and safety laws for all parties, making a business or you know, intending to make a business profitable or not, that they know that they're a PCBU because people don't know what a PCBU is. We need to be concerned about all the new experts that are providing advice and giving free stuff in this area who are not qualified, who don't know even what they're selling for free. Be concerned about the levels and the sources of data. People are confused. Be concerned about the conflicting state regulator approaches as this confusion adds and employers and businesses don't know which way to go, we are seeing many states doing lots of different things and having five different approaches to the same thing. So we need to consider, can the regulators work a little bit more together and have the same approach? Look, I think that horse is bolted and because of it, we're having to help businesses understand what is required in each state. And we even have released uh, a, a, a document about this for each state. So being in a small business is tough, even without COVID-19. The margins and the profits are very low. And if all, cash is not a thing. We need to move to help the backbone of Australia and give them the best chance to race back to work so we can get Australian, the Australian economy moving again. The Australian government has had the benefit of working with the 7% of businesses in the last few weeks. Now it's time to get in touch with our 93% of small to medium businesses who need help to meet the laws to ready, aim, fire. Get in touch with your 93%.